Okay, it's the second Sunday of Advent, the one where we traditionally think about the the message of the prophets, and our reading um, focuses in on John the Baptist as a prophet. So these days he kind of gets two Sundays to himself. He gets this Sunday and next Sunday, but but this week in his function uh, as a prophet. And we're going to read from Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the river Jordan. But... When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe has been laid to the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. I had always thought that the parent I most resembled was my father. Temperament, build, hair colour, interests, not absolutely identical, but pretty similar. It was therefore a surprise when I went into a room in the office where I began my working life to find there a woman named Olive who said, you must be Joan Faulkner's son, you look so like her. It turned out that Olive had worked with my mum many years earlier. Who are you like? Sometimes I approach a Bible passage like that. Which of the characters are we like? And what does that tell us about our faith? And I want to take that line with today's passage. Who am I like in the reading? Who are you like? Firstly, are we like John the Baptist? I don't know how many times I've read this story in my life, but what I do know is that when I came to read it this week, my first reaction was, yeah, I think I identify with John the Baptist. Why? Because I like locusts and honey? Nope. Because I want to wear something made from camel's hair? Nope. Just ordered a new winter coat from Mountain Warehouse in a Black Friday deal. It was the line about one calling in the wilderness. And the word wilderness grabbed me. I thought, that's what my ministry is often like. Much of the time, I haven't seen the things I'd have hoped for. And much of the Methodist church feels as parched as the wilderness to me. Woe is me! But then I dug 
deeper instead of feeling sorry for myself. I thought of what the wilderness symbolises in the scriptures. One thing it symbolises is testing. Just as God tested the faithfulness of Israel in the wilderness on their way from Egypt to the promised land. And so I wondered whether a prolonged period of spiritual drought was one where my faithfulness to God was being tested. Furthermore, I wondered about the drought the Christian church finds herself in, as evidenced by the news this week about the substantial fall in the numbers of people calling themselves Christians in this country. But then, perhaps we are being tested by God to see whether we will be faithful to him in disappointing circumstances. The temptation at a time of decline is to start adjusting our message to fit what people popularly believe. But that is a serious mistake. For one thing, it means we won't be faithful to Christ when to do so means being unpopular. And I think we know what he said about that. For another, it's a tactical mistake. Because if we make ourselves just like the rest of the society, then there's no longer any point in conversion. But the wilderness is also the place of renewal. God promises to bring his people back from exile in Babylon through the wilderness to their own land. So it's fitting that John locates his campaign for the renewal of Israel in the wilderness. So as we witness more and more decline and death in the British church, we also pray, Lord, turn this wilderness into a place of renewal and growth. Meanwhile, what do we do? We trust in God. That's what the locusts and honey are about. They're not a description of a Bush Tucker trial from I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. They were the basic foods available to John if he was simply just going to adopt a simple lifestyle in the desert. Honey was a regular sweetener for the poor and for others in his culture. Other wilderness dwellers often fed on locusts. Just don't go looking for them among the more unusual foodstuffs at Waitrose. John was saying, I am willing to live simply and live on what God directly provides for me. So, if we ponder John the Baptist, our question is something like this. How willing are we to trust God like he did? Secondly, are we like the crowds? It isn't difficult for the people to go and hear John. His location is just... 20 miles from Jerusalem. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us that the crowds were so large that Herod Antipas, the local ruler on behalf of the Romans, feared an uprising. It was a big deal. But if it was easy for them to get there, it wasn't so easy for them to fulfil what John was calling them to do. He preached that they needed to repent. And here, repentance doesn't simply mean change your mind. It means turn your whole life around. We see them doing this because Matthew tells us that they were baptised by John when they confessed their sins. Let's pause and consider what a humbling thing this was to do for the average Jew. 
See, John was not asking them just to follow through with a liturgical ritual act. He was expecting a complete change of lifestyle. But he is expecting this, you know, from devout Jews. These are people who are already committed to faith in God. John is saying to them, well, you might just as well be a pagan Gentile. Such is the level of turnaround you actually need in your lives. They were being treated by John as if they'd never demonstrated any serious commitment to God before. Despite having followed the Jewish way of life and taken part in its rituals for years, I gained a small insight into what that might feel for someone many years ago. As a good number of you, especially those who know me, know, when I was exploring God's call to the ministry, I ended up studying theology as an independent student at an Anglican theological college, despite the fact that my roots were all Methodist. And when the calling to ministry became clear, I, I had a quandary. Did I stay with my native Methodism, or did I opt to go into the Church of England, for which I was seeing a very good advert at this college? It was the thought that I would have to be confirmed just like I'd never been a Christian because I hadn't had the magic hands of a bishop on my head that ultimately put me off the C of E. To me, it denied the previous work of the Holy Spirit. Now, what if I, or some other preacher, told you that all your Methodist heritage was in vain in terms of getting into God's kingdom? Just because you were a church steward for many years didn't count. Just because you knew Wesley's hymns inside out meant nothing. Just because you had taught Sunday school or being a local preacher, well, so what? Rip it all up and start again. That's what John expected of the crowds. What if we need to do that? What if all that we do, much as we cherish it, has declined into empty ritual and dead religion? Do any of us need to heed John's call to a radical turning back to Christ and a complete reset of our spiritual lives? Does anyone hearing this today need that? Or, thirdly and finally, are we like the Pharisees and Sadducees? Well, if you thought that John was hard on the ordinary crowds, just wait until you hear him tear into the religious leaders. A brood of vipers, he calls them. That was an ancient insult. There was a belief that had been around for a few centuries, it went back actually to the Greek historian Herodotus, who lived five centuries before the birth of Christ. And he said that vipers were mother killers, that the children, the brood, killed their mothers in revenge for the fact that the mother killed the father during the procreation ritual. Mother killer becomes then a way of saying that these leaders, a brood of vipers, were morally depraved. And therefore, being children of Abraham, as they claimed, counted for nothing. 
some of you have heard me say that my sister once worked out when doing some work on the family uh, genealogy that she and I had grown up as fifth generation same congregation but that would have meant nothing spiritually if we had not both separately taken the decision to follow Jesus Christ in our lives all that upbringing would be worth nothing don't say you've got your Abraham for your father says Jesus same thing and that's why I get disappointed when I go to a church and I'm greeted by someone who tells me with pride that they are a lifelong Methodist they think I'll be impressed but it counts for nothing unless that person has actually embraced Wesley's call to repentance and faith and is leading them into a life of discipleship that's the only form of lifelong Methodist I'm interested in but John the Baptist exposes these religious leaders the Pharisees and the Sadducees as people who rested on their spiritual heritage while using that as a cover for shamelessly immoral behavior now I'd like to tell you that that doesn't exist in the church today but I'd be lying from time to time I encounter it I don't mean those who are genuinely struggling to conquer sin but not always succeeding I mean those who are happy to use religious respectability as a cover for a totally different lifestyle you know the sort of stories that make salacious media headlines from time to time and therefore can bring the church into disrepute now I sincerely hope that this third and final point is the one that makes least connection with anybody listening today perhaps it's more made to be preached at a synod or a conference but were any of us to be living a double life outwardly proclaiming our faithfulness to the truth while using that to hide a shameful life then Advent is the time to hear Jesus' warning that he won't play games with us he can make new faithful people out of stones we shouldn't rely on some sense of being indispensable to him so all these three people or sets of people we've considered point us to the fact that Advent is a season of preparation but it's a preparation that happens by repentance not for nothing have some Christian traditions referred to Lent as the lesser Lent we prepare for Christ's coming by inviting the Holy Spirit to examine our speak at our hearts he prepares the way of the Lord in us and he is the one who makes straight paths in our lives so let us be open to him and willing to do what he wants that's it for this week I hope you'll be back next week for the third Sunday in Advent where we really will be concentrating again in a different way on John the Baptist thanks for being here I hope you'll be back next week God bless you and bye bye